just like the Silicon Valley bank run was part of the Kabuki theater to make people afraid of banks. Well, why would you want to make people afraid of banks? Well, because they're going to give you a solution coming up pretty soon called the CBDC. And if you, people think that's a solution, you're just not paying attention. Today, I interviewed friend of the channel, Mark Yusko, who is the CEO, founder, CIO of Morgan Creek Capital Management. And we discuss the future of cryptocurrency in 2023, including BlackRock getting into Bitcoin, the worst case scenario for Operation Choke Point 2.0, Mark's best advice, his best alpha for crypto investors today. But before all that, Mark, are we close to an end with Operation Choke Point 2.0? I fear it's not the end. It's not the beginning of the end. It may perhaps be the end of the beginning, as Churchill famously said. So, look, I've talked about this, this period of time since the launch of, of Bitcoin. You know, 09 to 15, kind of that first six years was the first day ignore you phase. It's like yeah, a bunch of nerds and geeks playing through magic internet money, who cares? Um, then they laugh at you, right? So that was 16 to 21, kind of, ha ha, bunch of nerds and geeks. Yeah, a couple billion here, billion there. Pretty soon you're talking real money. 2022 to now, and I think unfortunately until 2027-ish, whatever the number is, is the then they fight you phase. And, and look, this is a massive, concerted, intentional effort right and people say oh no it's just coincidences no they're, they're not coincidences um it's not a coincidence that we're getting these announcements now with the big uh you know btc i mean not btc the big uh uh fintech trad is the word i'm searching for austin sorry uh -huh. um big trad company saying oh yeah we want we want to do this um, BlackRock, oh, we, we want to do an ETF for, for, for crypto or for Bitcoin. Really? Really? I mean, think about this. Not a month ago. I mean, it's not even like a year ago or two years ago or five years ago. Not a month ago. The SEC was like, you're a villain if you're even touching this space. You're bad now. Everybody. I mean, Deutsche Bank this morning and Fidelity over the weekend and BlackRock last week. And, you know, everybody's jumping in the pool. Um, now, why? Why is that? I will argue that this started a handful of years ago when, you know, they appointed the guy in charge, the guy in charge. Right. He was teaching a blockchain class at MIT. And now he's, you know, the enforcer. Yeah, that's that's weird. And you had, you know, basically all these incumbents vilified and in many cases now sued. So, yeah, it's a long rambling way of saying, yeah, I think choke point is real. I think it's been going on for a while. I think um, Sam and FTX were the useful idiots that were concocted to create this illusion of, oh, all the bad people and all the bad stuff is happening. You know, I, I, I used to laugh. I, used, I, you know, you'd hear people like Ms. Warren and, and others say, oh, crypto is only used for money laundering and terrorism. I was like, right. The biggest terrorism tool in the world is the U S dollar full stop. Right. It's not, it's not close. But what I didn't realize was they had inside information they were actually doing the money laundering with crypto through FTX. So there's a whole bunch of stuff there that, you know, we don't even have to dive into that bad stuff, bad people doing bad stuff. So what still scares you about Operation Choke Point 2.0? Because we've seen the SEC already go over the, go after the top exchanges. They've already yeah, declared. Yeah, they're some coming the for the little guys. I'm, I'm, I said this last week on another show that I do every Friday and uh, I'm waiting for the shoes to drop this week. You know, I, I don't have any inside knowledge. I'm not friendly with anybody at the SEC. I'm not, you know, I'm not, I'm not repeating anything untoward. I, I just, I have a really bad feeling that some, some stuff's coming and, you know, they've been systematically attacking 
the the highest levels of success. And I think they're about to go down into the DeFi space. And, and look, if, if you can literally change the rules after the game starts, that's a tough environment for founders and entrepreneurs and, and investors to win, right? I mean, literally if you dribbled across half court in a basketball game and they said, oh, you know, we changed the rules. You can't cross half court anymore. I mean, that rule actually existed in Oklahoma uh, up until like the 1990s for women, not, not for guys, but for women had to play three on three. You had to pass, the defense had to pass the ball to the offense and you couldn't go across mid court. So, you know, the average person trying to play basketball would say that doesn't make any sense. And so if if suddenly anyone who transacted in DeFi is now criminal, I mean, come on, really? I mean, that's some crazy stuff. Well, I shouldn't say criminal. You violated securities law. It doesn't make it criminal, but but you know, violated securities laws. That's crazy stuff. And I think I think we're that close. Again, don't don't know for sure, but but I just have a really bad feeling that reading the tea leaves that's what it, it it looks like is is coming next how big a deal is the blackrock etf application because to me it seems that damn bitcoin is is free and clear um now more than ever yeah. compared to yeah, DeFi. yeah yeah oh look it's huge and look i've been talking about this for a long time you know everybody was applying and you know the winklevoss twins and van eck and and uh my friends at um a bunch of different firms um, you know, we're, we're trying to get an ETF approved. And I said, zero chance, like no chance anyone of those was going to get approved. People said, well, why? I said, because BlackRock is the only one that's ever going to get approved. And people said, they haven't even, they haven't even, you know, applied yet. Like they will, and they'll get approved. And people said, well, why do you think that? I'm like, well, because they're part of the tent, right? You're either under the tent or you're outside the tent. And all of us who are trying to disrupt those under the tent, look, the trust business has had a great 800 years. That's a long run. 800 years of us, the plebs, trusting the banksters to safeguard our money. And we pay, this is a crazy stat, we pay globally, Seven trillion dollars with a T every year for banking, assurance, auditing, brokerage, all the the trust industry, financial services, broadly speaking, seven trill every year. And the truth technology, right? We're going from trust to truth with blockchains, can get rid of most of that, if not all of it. They don't like that, right? Because that's somebody's revenue. And those people are really powerful. They make the laws. It's the golden rule. He who has the gold makes the rules. So those under the tent are going to do everything they can to keep those outside the tent from getting inside. And if that means changing the rules so that they get to control it. Now, I actually got an interesting debate this morning with one of my partners, which is kind of interesting because I, I would consider him pretty far out there on the, the decentralization spectrum. And he's like, oh, you know, there's no decentralization. Anymore. It's gone. You know, they've, they've, got, they've got control of all the on-ramps, the off-ramps. They can put you in jail. Like, you know, Andrew Tate, he was citing Andrew Tate. I'm like, well, look, you go to Romania, all bets are off. It's like that movie about the guy who was smuggling hashish yeah. in Turkey, right? You go into a foreign country and break some laws, I yeah, you might get in trouble. But I don't think just for transacting in, in Bitcoin, you, you go to jail in the United States, at least yet. Um, but they could pass that law too. So he was really down. And I was like, wow, I'd never seen that before. And I'm still of the belief that we can win. In fact, I believe we have won, right? If you're in this space, if you're pursuing this technology, you know, the fourth part of the quote, right? 
after then they fight you is then you win from Mandela, although Mandela didn't say it, some other, but somebody else said it for him. But um, I can never remember that guy's name either, which is sad because I should give him credit, but uh, we should look that up and put it in the show notes. But let's do it. Um, I, I do feel like it is a huge deal. And I think it sets the stage for a pretty meaningful bull market, which you know, look, I, I declared crypto summer started on June 15th. And I said that months ago. And it's funny because, well, why? I'm like, well, it's just the seasonality of, of how it works. It's four year cycle and you break it into four pieces. And June 15th was when we went from spring to some, I mean, from winter to spring a year ago. And so June 15th was, was going to be the equinox this year. Now, I, again, I had no idea that, that was going to be the day of the BlackRock announcement. And it's literally the bottom. Like it's been up only since last Wednesday or Thursday, whatever day that was. Um, uh, that's weird, right? I mean, that's that's an odd, an odd thing. But it's fully expected when big institutions, big organizations, wealthy investors have been doing this for years. I, I tweeted this out earlier today. It's the oldest trick in the book, right? If you want to buy a lot of something, what do you do? You shit on it, right? When George Soros wanted to corner the market in copper, right? What did he do? He didn't go out and buy a bunch of copper. He went out and sold a bunch of copper and spread rumors that copper was going to zero. Then you swoop in and buy a whole bunch after the price collapses. And big institutions have been doing that. Elon does that all the time and all kinds of stuff. Um, that's that's how big operators operate is you don't go buy it and then tell everybody you bought it and everybody clap and watch it go up. You want to buy it cheaper. So that's what I think went on last year is, look, it's again, not a coincidence. The day of the peak in 2021 was the day they allowed the Bitcoin futures ETF to happen. I mean, it's the day. Well, why does that matter? Well, because the banks and people like BlackRock could go naked short. You could create paper negative Bitcoin. You could go short Bitcoin. And that pushed the price down and got all the weak hands to fold, all the leverage out of the system. And then they sacrificed FTX to make it appear that you know bad people doing bad things even though there's not much going on there. I mean, it's it's kind of like FTX to me reminds me of, of Madoff, right? They called Madoff a hedge fund problem, but there was no hedge and there was no fund. I mean, he hadn't made a trade in 13 years, so there was no hedging going on. And he was literally, his brother-in-law was taking the money and putting it in Bernie's account. There was no fund. It was just, it was just a bad person doing bad stuff. And that's the same thing. So all oh, Alameda was this big trading firm. No, no, they weren't. Look at look at the data. They were they were not big. They 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 were not sophisticated. They were not good. They lost their ass in Luna, which precipitated this whole thing. So I think it was part of the whole wrapping it all back to choke point. I think it was all part of the the kabuki theater to make people afraid, just like the Silicon Valley bank run was part of the kabuki theater to make people afraid of banks. Well, why would you want to make people afraid of banks? Well, because they're going to give you a solution coming up pretty soon called the CBDC. And if you people think that's a solution, you're just not paying attention, right? You should be very, very, very afraid of CBDCs. Mark, final question. And again, for the audience, all your links are down below in the video description. You talk about on Twitter a lot, edge or, you know, alpha yeah. or advice. Yeah. Yeah. Today in crypto, what's an edge you have in your mind? You know, edge to me is, is what makes great players, investors, people, artists, whatever it is, great, right? So it, what defines greatness? And there are lots of different edges, right? In, in investing, you could, in the olden days, you could have an informational edge. Literally, you could get information before other people. And it wasn't illegal, right? You could go meet a CEO and you could ask him questions that other people couldn't ask and him or her. And 
and you could get edge. Then they you know, outlawed that with regulation FD. You're not allowed to go talk to people that other people can't talk to. I'm like, why? That's just good research. That's just good access. That's so not if you're pay to play, but but if you're just doing good work. Or so then it was about an analytical edge. You could build a better model. Well, then everyone had models. Then it became a speed edge, right? If you moved your computers closer to the exchange so you could get the information faster. Okay. And now that edge is eroded because everybody's got high frequency trading. So then it became, you got to own the market makers. So it was a scale edge, right? Everybody trades through Citadel. Like I still don't understand why anyone would borrow stock from Citadel to go short because they'll just squeeze you, right? Why, why would anyone do that? Why? I don't understand, but people do. And he makes a lot of money. I mean, Ken's probably the smartest guy I've ever met in my life. I mean, the guy's a mad genius, but, um, so that's a long winding answer to say edge can be many, many things, but edge, maybe the greatest edge, and I, I, I hate gives him, you know, I'm in Chapel Hill and I'm a, you know, Tar Heel fan, even though I'm a Notre Dame person, that's my sign up there. But I have to give credit to Coach K because he's the one that, that said this to me. I was, you know, talking with him, you know, probably 15 years ago and says, you know what separates the great players from the average players? I'm like, well, I have some ideas, but you're going to tell me. So, okay, I'm I'm game. And he said, well, the average player, this true investor or anybody really, always focuses on the last play. And think about it, we just saw the basketball finals. How many times do you see it? Someone misses a shot and they go back and commit a stupid foul because they're thinking about missing the shot. He says a great player always focuses on the next play. Right? They don't even remember taking the shot. Total erasure, go back, play good defense, steal the ball, make a layup. And the same thing's true here. If if you're constantly focused on the last play, you know, the last time someone screwed you or the last time the government came after you or the last time you had a loss or, the, you know, the last time you missed an opportunity, you're never going to do anything, right? You'd be paralyzed by fear or inaction. The great edge is the ability to constantly be looking forward to constantly be learning from your failures. You know, the the great coach, Dean Smith, uh, said you have to Ralph, right? When you make a mistake, and we all make mistakes, you got to recognize it, okay? The hardest part, admitting it. That's hard because we all have ego and we don't want to say we're wrong. Um, you got to learn from it, and then you got to forget it. And that forgetting, that's the common theme. You got to forget. You got to, you know, go forward. And for me... Right now in crypto, the edge is, uh, it's not over, right? It's not the end. It's not even the beginning of the end. It's the end of the beginning. And so this technology is going to win and we're all going to win, but we have to keep focusing on the next play. And are there things that people were focused on that are going to get shut down? 100%, 100%, right? There are things that are going to be deemed securities, they're going to get shut down and we're going to have to move on from that. Uh, are we going to have to play by a, a different set of rules, kind of like a combo set of rules while the, then they fight you phases on? Yep. It's not going to be fully decentralized all the time um, because the incumbents don't like it. Will we win? Yep. We'll win. But you just got to keep getting back up dust yourself off. You know, it's the old adage, fall down seven times, get up eight. And, um, you know, channel Mandela, right? You know, he went to jail for what he believed and uh, came out stronger and, and, and made a huge impact on the world. So yes, they will fight us. But if you're here and you're in, and you're in the, this business, if you're watching this, we've already won. Um, maybe I don't feel like it right now, but we've won. Mark, thanks, man. Links to your stuff down below. Uh, thank you.